everyone, uh, and thank you very much for in joining our uh, second quarter webinar today. Uh, we plan on first covering kind of a Q2 review and, and all that's happened uh, during second quarter and, and, and mostly what's happened here to date. And then, and then we'll uh, turn to um, a deeper dive into uh, artificial intelligence and the uh, investment opportunities there that we see for investors. Um, first, I would uh, like to introduce myself, Travis Briggs, I'm CEO US of Robo Global. Joining us is uh, Lisa Chai, who's senior research analyst and also the author of our latest white paper, uh, the artificial intelligence paper I was referring to earlier, and Jeremy Capron, who is director of research and managing director at Robo Global. So we look forward to, uh, to having this call with you all today, and thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of Robo Global for those of you who are not familiar with the firm. Um, actually, we were the, the first firm back in uh, 2013 to launch a strategy focused solely on uh, robotics and automation. Uh, essentially, we, we felt like automation represented a secular trend that was long live decades uh, potential for, for, oppor for growth opportunities. And so really built a firm around deep research and truly understanding a theme. Uh, a lot of times when you look at thematic funds, uh, such as uh, robotics or healthcare or, or the artificial intelligence uh, strategy that we're talking about today, um, people misconstrue thematic for niche. Uh, and if you think about uh, whether it be automation or certainly artificial intelligence, what you see is a technology that's not just penetrating one specific area of the economy, but rather across the entire scope of the economy and uh, there's certainly nothing niche about that. So over the last almost seven years, we've uh, launched uh, three indexes, uh, concentrated uh, investment strategies uh, in Asia as well, and uh, currently have, I believe, slightly over two and a half billion dollars uh, tracking uh, our indexes and our, and our active strategies. Um, one of the things that I always want to highlight is uh, we start the, uh, the presentation uh, or webinar is, is the unique construction of how we built Robo. Uh, we have deployed a, a, an in-deep research team, but we combine that with, uh, with a strong collaboration with our strategic, our strategic advisors. Um, you know, there's 10 of them up there. Uh, I'll just talk about a couple of them, but uh, they really are an integral part uh, as you navigate kind of the rapidly evolving areas of thematic investing to really have those uh, industry entrepreneurs and academic experts, really the true uh, renowned figures in the field to help kind of guide to, the, to set the, the curbs and, and allow us to do the deep research where it really matters. Uh, a couple I'll mention uh, who are really with us from day one was Henrik Christensen and Rafael D'Andrea. Both were uh, original, uh, not only advisors, but they're also partners of the firm. Uh, Henrik is uh, one of the most renowned roboticists uh, in the country or even the world. Um, he was the editor to write the first U.S. robotics roadmap for President Obama, presented it to Congress, and has continued to be the editor, updating that every four years. Um, for the government. Uh, Rafael de Andrea is uh, also uh, an integral part of our team. He was the co-founder of Kiva Systems. Uh, Kiva, for those who you don't know, uh, is now what there has become uh, Amazon Robotics. Um, and so he uh, sold his firm Kiva to Amazon, which is those little orange bots that you see, clearly an industry expert. And then the last uh, one I'll, I'll point to is because it kind of indicates how we work with our advisors. Uh, when we launched the Think strategy uh, and realized how important artificial intelligence was to um, really even not just uh, not just the economy, but even in particular as it related to us in automation, um, we went out and, and really looked for the best person we could find and 
that person was Danielle Roos, who's a professor. She's really the director uh, of the artificial intelligence program at MIT, uh, which is known by some as the birthplace uh, of artificial intelligence. So that's a, a quick overview of, uh, of us, what we do in our team. And uh, now let's dive into Q2. I think the next slide is performance. And Jeremy, maybe you want to tackle that. Okay, thank you, Travis. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to kick off with this table that shows the total returns of the Robo Global Innovation Indices and Global Equities for the second quarter and uh, multi year periods. And, and you can see some pretty big numbers up here as uh, stock markets around the globe bounced off the, the March lows to recoup some of the first quarter losses. And with the exception of the NASDAQ and by now uh, Chinese stocks, most markets are still down for the year. But as you can see here, um, our three tr strategies uh, recoup not only all of the Q1 losses, but uh, some more to end the, the first uh, the first half of the year well into positive territory. Uh, the Robo uh, Robotics and Automation Index was up 29% uh, in the second quarter. HTEC, which is the Healthcare Technology and Innovation Index, was up 31%. And Think, THNQ, the Artificial Intelligence Index, was up 44%. And you can also see here the remarkable long-term performance of the three strategies well ahead of global equities in the past one, three, and five years. Um, one important note here is that Robo does have uh, more than five years of uh, uh, history, and, and so the numbers you can see are real, um, uh, re real life uh, performance data, but for HTEC and THINK, which are a little more recent, the three-year and five-year data represents a backtest of the uh, initial portfolio. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we've seen in the markets in uh, the second quarter and how uh, we are positioned for uh, the future. And uh, on our investor call three months ago, we discussed three important points that I want to uh, reiterate today. First, we said that the COVID-19 crisis would accelerate the digitization of the economy and that many of the technology and market leaders in robotics, in AI, in healthcare technology would come out to the other side of this crisis uh, on a stronger footing and uh, that uh, they would gain market share and, and uh, that the adoption of their technology could, could see an acceleration. Uh, the second point is that we said that bear markets typically end with the recession. They don't start with the recession. Um, and the third point is that we said that this recession was likely to be deep but short-lived because of the temporary nature of, uh, of the, uh, this crisis, of this uh, uh, pandemic. And, and because of the unprecedented response in terms of monetary and fiscal actions uh, that we've seen around the world that, that we believe is well in excess of 20% of GDP. So you fast forward to today, and I think the market is comforting this view. And it's increasingly clear that the global recession is now past its nadir. And while there is concern that the pandemic is not yet under control in the Americas, uh, we believe that it is now unlikely that we will see uh, renewed lockdowns and therefore the reopening dynamics are, um, are firmly in place. Uh, we think that the three portfolios are uh, well positioned to continue to outperform for the remainder of the year and for the years to come for uh, several reasons. I think uh, number one, uh, we have focused on technology disruptors. Again, technology disruptors that are likely to gain share as the digitization of the economy accelerates, especially in the areas of AI, uh, in uh, factory and logistics uh, automation, enterprise software that we'll talk about when we uh, go deeper into uh, the AI portfolio, and healthcare technology. Uh, second, 
Our portfolios have very strong balance sheets. Uh, in fact, Robo has an average debt of uh, zero, and over 60% of its members hold a net cash position. And you will see that HTAG and Think also have a majority of their members uh, on a net cash position. And, uh, and, and the last reason I want to mention is that, you know, after big sell-offs, typically we see small and mid-caps uh, and early cyclicals that tend to do best uh, in, in market recovery. And, and they did in, in the second quarter. However, small caps and mid caps remain laggards so far uh, this year. And uh, both Robo and HTAG have a very strong tilt towards small and mid caps uh, at 69% for Robo and 60% for, for HTAG. And typically, uh, they're composed of stocks that are not in, uh, in most growth oriented portfolios. The overlap with broad market indices is extremely low. In the case of Robo, under uh, 3%. So let's talk about Robo. Um, I'm, I, I want to move to uh, the next slide here. Yes, yeah, so um, Robo is a research driven index of best in class robotics automation companies from around the world. It covers the entire value chain from the core enabling technologies that make automated systems possible uh, to the applications across manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, consumer, foods, et cetera. And, and as you can see here, it's uh, outperformed the World Equity Index over time, um, including in the past quarter, in the past year, the past three years, the past five years, uh, with annualized returns that are uh, somewhere between 50% 90% above uh, the MSCI uh, ACWI uh, index. In Q2, all of our 12 subsectors uh, recorded gains, and the best performing sectors were consumer robotics, that more than doubled, and logistics automation, uh, that was up around 40%. I want to talk about logistics automation because that, this, this is a very important uh, piece of our investment strategy. Uh, it accounts for 11% of the Robo Index by weight. And we think it will benefit from the enormous strain that has been put on uh, the e-commerce industry during the past few months. Demand has significantly increased. And a lot of this demand, we believe, is going to remain as things go back to normal. So think about grocery deliveries, uh, for example. And this is creating a step up in terms of adoption of automation technologies to improve supply chains and warehouse uh, efficiency. Um, so companies like Manhattan Associates, uh, and I want to, to move to the, the next slide here, please, uh, Aaron, if you could help me with that. Um, it, it, that slide shows the uh, top and bottom performers for uh, the Robo Index in Q2. You can see Manhattan Associates is up there. Um, the, uh, this is the best of breed provider of supply chain and warehouse uh, management software. And uh, we're seeing other companies like Okado in the UK, uh, the online grocer and provider of order fulfillment technology solutions. Uh, or Daifuku in uh, Japan, that's the global leader in material handling equipment. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps Zebra Technologies here in the US. All of these companies that are part of our logistics subsector are uh, doing really well at the moment and we, and we think the uh, outlook for their older books uh, looks very strong. Uh, just a word on iRobot. Uh, that's a well-known uh, home automation uh, company, probably the, the, the world's leading home automation company and the creator of the Roomba robotic vacuum system. Uh, this, uh, uh, the stock was up over 100% in, in Q2. Uh, basically, the company raised expectations for their second quarter revenue by nearly 40% above prior expectations as they, uh, we went into the crisis. So consumers are demanding uh, uh, that the uh, robotic vacuum cleaners uh, for uh, you know, keeping your house clean in the current environment is probably 
uh, at the top of the priority list. And, and that stock had come under a lot of pressure last year because of the tariffs imposed on China-made products. Um, another area of strength for robo uh, right now is computing, processing, and AI. That is the largest segment in the index at about 20% uh, by weight. And, and that really is the backbone of, uh, you know, that enables many aspects of remote working. Uh, from uh, the semiconductors to uh, the networking equipment. Uh, and so we're seeing pretty, pretty strong performance here right now. And uh, at the bottom of the table, you know, 3D printing, uh, which is a small sector for robo, uh, a sector in which we believe in the potential for rapid growth in the long term, but in the near term, the exposure of additive manufacturing uh, companies to uh, the automotive sector and the aerospace sector that have been greatly hurt by uh, the, the, the COVID crisis, you know, is, is very large. So those stocks, uh, 3D printing, I think, was up just 3% in, uh, in the quarter. Uh, finally, I wanted to say a few words on the Rubo portfolio as it currently stands. Uh, our methodology combines the, that, that research approach for company selection that's based on long-term value drivers with the discipline of index investing in the sense that uh, we more or less equal weight stocks to give fair representation to small companies. And uh, every quarter we reconstitute and rebalance the portfolio, uh, which means that we sell our winners and we buy our losers, which is a, a way to ensure that the index buys low and, and, and sells high. And if you look at the pie chart here, you can see that the, uh, I think the key word is diversification. Uh, diversification across uh, sectors on the left-hand side, uh, across countries in the, the middle chart here with more than a dozen countries represented and also diversification across the market cap spectrum with a strong tilt towards small, small and mid caps. Um, I think I'll leave it here for Robo. I want to touch on uh, uh, the healthcare technology and innovation index before passing it on to, uh, to Lisa for, for AI. So the, the HTEC index was designed to capitalize on the best companies around the world that are leading the healthcare technology revolution. Uh, HTEC was up 31% in Q2 uh, after declining by 11% in the first quarter and uh, that leaves it up 17% for the year. And we saw double digit returns in uh, eight of the nine sectors that compose uh, HTEC. We saw the strongest performance coming from data analytics that was up more than 40% and diagnostics also up more than 40%. Uh, and uh, regenerative medicine was the, the weakest performer. Uh, down by, by a few points. Uh, let me talk about the data analytics uh, sector uh, where we're seeing uh, increasing demand for remote patient monitoring capabilities during the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, that remote monitoring is uh, enabled by uh, software platforms from companies like Livongo. Livongo was uh, our best stock in the, in, in the second quarter, it was up 160%. Uh, Livongo uh, provides uh, devices that can help people manage their chronic illnesses, uh, like diabetes and uh, hypertension. Uh, and, and people can do that on the go. And uh, with the, the risk uh, around the, the, the diabetic population, uh, with uh, COVID-19, uh, Livongo saw a clear acceleration in adoption of their uh, solution. In fact, they saw their member enrollment surge by over 100% during uh, the first quarter of the year. Um, in diagnostics, we saw companies like uh, Quidel, uh, that was our, our second best performing stock, and others like uh, Hologic, um, or Abbott and, uh, and Danaher or Diasorin in Italy, all these companies that have come up with uh, tests uh, specifically for COVID. 
And uh, obviously a, a very strong increase in demand for testing is driven the performance for, uh, for the stocks, as I said, uh, diagnostics as a group. Uh, so performance of more than 40% in, in the quarter. And on the right hand side, you can see the bottom performers uh, in general. What we saw is that, uh, you know, the, the areas that have been impacted by delays uh, suffered the most as uh, hospitals were uh, filling up with COVID patients, a number of elective procedures were delayed. And so some uh, instruments companies uh, face some, uh, some problems here. And so NovoCure is one of them. Uh, NovoCure makes a device that uses electric uh, fields to uh, help treat cancer. Uh, and like several other medical instrument companies, this, this will delays in uh, enrollments for their uh, clinical trials. Uh, and Axogen is part of our uh, regenerative medicine sector. Axogen uh, is uh, specializing in uh, nerve repairs. Um, just want to touch also uh, real quick on some really interesting uh, advancements that we saw on the genomic side uh, during the quarter. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard about Moderna that uh, is a pioneer in uh, uh, mRNA therapies. Uh, Moderna was uh, able to advance their um, innovation at record speed, you know, uh, coming up with a COVID vaccine uh, potentially uh, in uh, just over 40 days. And they are moving uh, into the uh, phase three clinical trials uh, sometime in the next few weeks. Another interesting development around CRISPR, CRISPR technology that uh, enables gene editing. Uh, we saw CRISPR Therapeutics, uh, a HTEC member, and Vertex, uh, another HTEC member that presented some very promising data around uh, a trial for uh, beta thalassemia treatment. Uh, and CRISPR Therapeutics also announced a plan to uh, build a new state-of-the-art facility in Massachusetts to produce their allogenic CAR T cell therapy programs. Uh, just want to finish real quick here on the HTEC portfolio as it currently stands. Once again, the key word here is diversification. Uh, unlike market cap weighted uh, healthcare indices, you can see that this is not a concentrated portfolio of large cap pharma companies, which is what your typical healthcare ETF or, or index um, would show. Uh, HTEC is a diversified index uh, of companies that are disrupting healthcare as we know it. And you can see that small and mid caps account for uh, well over 50% and uh, international stocks account for about 30%. That the active share relative to the S&P 500 or global equities is very high with an overlap of uh, uh, less than 5%. So with that, I wanna pass it on to Lisa to talk about Think the Artificial Intelligence Index. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so Think Index is a strategy that captures the mega trend of artificial intelligence as companies, small or large, are seeing acceleration of growth from the AI deployments that's occurring around the world today. For second quarter, as you can see, um, TCHNQ surged almost 44%, outperforming the MSCI World Index and the S&P 500. Um, every 11 of the subsectors of the index finished in positive territory during the quarter, with e-commerce as the top contributor. What is driving this incredible performance is that the demand for cloud solutions combined with AI capabilities is gaining tremendous momentum. These companies are building uh, key data assets and leveraging machine learning machine learning capabilities to deliver new revenue streams and drive cost savings within their organization. Um, one thing I want to highlight is that almost 70% of the Think Index members have net cash position, which we think it's very important in navigating through this volatile environment that we have today. 
Um, we anticipate that enterprises will continue to increase capital investments in technology over the next several years, especially in the areas of AI, advanced analytics, and cloud computing, um, which should continue through to support the growth prospects of these index members. Um, to go deeper into the second quarter performance, um, e-commerce subsector experienced um, strong performance, as we mentioned. Um, it grew 84% during the quarter as a stay-at-home orders boosted demand for online shopping, um, highlighting the importance of digital transformation, basically. Um, index members, uh, including Shopify and Wix, are well positioned as they're providing solutions that connect merchants with its customers using their advanced analytic and machine learning algorithms. Um, another subsector to highlight is the big data analytics. Um, it delivered outstanding performance, up 63% in second quarter. Um, index members, including Alteryx and Splunk, are examples of companies that are empowering businesses to derive intelligent data to gather meaningful insights for use in their everyday decision-making process. Um, Consulting service subsector underperformed other subsectors this quarter um, due to a softer demand for strategy and consulting services. Um, as major implementations uh, projects remained on hold with the travel restrictions we had this year. Um, however, we are starting to see signs of recovery uh, as the economy begins to reopen um, for the consulting group. Um, shares of Accenture, for example, declined over 50% in the first quarter, but since then it has recovered nicely up 32% in Q2. So we are somewhat bullish in consulting over the longer term. Um, and second quarter notable performance um, to highlight is that Wix was a top performer, um, posting strong earnings results and shares closed up over 150% at the end of second quarter. Um, Wix is a leading builder of website design using AI and the current health crisis that we've seen magnify the importance of having an online presence for small and medium businesses as well as brands that they have to move all of their business online as quickly as possible to engage with customers. Um, Twilio is a communication as a services company also posted very strong results with 57% revenue growth year over year, um, highlighting its unique customer engagement platform that automates call centers using AI capabilities. Um, their messaging platform is embedded with machine learning algorithm to improve customer interactions. So the shares of Twilio were up 145% during the quarter. Um, in terms of underperformers, Teradata is a, is a, they are a leading pioneer of data warehouse solutions. They have been shifting their business to hybrid cloud solutions over the last couple of years, but the transition may have been too late. Um, company is losing market share as a company goes through this transition time. So the first quarter results were very underwhelming. Um, Teradata shares were down 1% during the quarter, uh, which is a big underperformance relative to other data center and enablers of the cloud. Um, Blue Prism is one of the top three robotic process automation uh, players, but they underperformed during the quarter. Um, the company experienced weaker than expected closing rates due to the COVID-19, but we believe this is a very short-term impact um, as Blue Prism is seeing increased interest in its next generation platform, which is really integrated with lots of advanced AI. And the company also stated that it has a very strong pipeline over the next few quarters. Um, shares were up just 1% during the quarter, which is also an underperformance relative to its peers. Um, on the next slide, um, as you can see from this slide, it just it highlights the portfolio characteristics of its broader AI ecosystem with 11 subsectors and its global exposure. And it's important to note that it has a very low overlap with the MSCI World Index, as well as the S&P 500 Index. And um, back to you, Travis. Great, thanks, Lisa, I appreciate that. Um, 
we have had uh, a couple of questions. So that some of that concludes kind of the Q2 review, and we're we're getting ready to dive into the uh, the AI discussion. Uh, but there are a, a couple of, uh, of quick questions uh, that maybe we can get answered uh, before we move on uh, from Q2 review. Um, one, uh, Jeremy, uh, uh, basically, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but he was questioning if there's a more relevant technology, I mean, a, a more relevant index to compare Robo to versus the uh, MS ACWI, uh, such as a technology focused index like NASDAQ. And then, yes. then also, uh, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. and then as a kind of a follow up, you know, also not just from a performance perspective, but also from a standard deviation perspective. Sure. I think that's a great question. We get that a lot. Uh, look, Robo is not a tech fund. Uh, as uh, amazing as this statement may, may sound, uh, if you look under the hood, what is Robo composed of? Uh, there's uh, tremendous diversity in terms of uh, the economic sectors that the companies play in. Uh, in terms of the business models from uh, capital equipment providers like uh, industrial robot manufacturers that fall into well into the industrial sector uh, to a software provider like Manhattan Associates that I mentioned that provides the, the software backbone for uh, warehouse uh, management and supply chains. Um, and, and, and so if you look at it from uh, through the, the geeks lens, you realize you're, you're very far from a tech fund. So I don't think uh, NASDAQ would be uh, too relevant. It probably is a lot more for the think portfolio where you'll find that most companies are tech companies per uh, geek uh, standards. Uh, but going back to, to Robo, uh, the uh, methodology behind the construction of the, of the index uh, is to start with that research process where we go after 12 different subsectors that, uh, that are uh, kind of the, our roadmap to capture the robotic automation ecosystem. And a big piece of that, uh, actually half of that, represents the enabling technologies that make uh, automated and autonomous systems possible. So think about the sensing, the computing, the actuation, how those systems interact with the physical world. And a lot of the companies that play in that area are tech companies. But if you look at the other half of the classification, you'll find uh, companies that deploy robotics and automated systems into uh, real use cases. And, And so manufacturing is a big piece of that. And then you'll see healthcare, you'll see food and agriculture, uh, you'll see 3D printing and, and, and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we are strong believer that in, in the uh, uh, robotics and AI as being a technology revolution. And as such, this is a uh, phenomenal wealth creation opportunity. And uh, the goal of our index portfolios is to provide investors with a simple uh, buy and hold vehicle to express this, this bullish view. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so at this point, I, I would like to uh, yeah, remind anyone who is not aware, there is a Q&A uh, bar down in the right, uh, right bottom part of your screen that you can ask questions. And uh, in the spirit of time, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the think uh, or the, the artificial intelligence presentation. And then at the end of that, obviously, we'll get back to answer as many questions as we can. And, uh, and if we don't get to your question, uh, I assure you, we'll, we'll get back to you um, uh, via email. Um, so moving, uh, moving forward, uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, what we had hoped to do and give um, is give a, a presentation essentially on kind of where we uh, what, what is AI right now? Where is it going and, and why is it important to investors? Um, I know uh, that we have seen uh, quite, uh, quite a rapid evolution. I think if one thing that is very interesting about this particular di- technology disruption is the, is the change of pace uh, in which it's occurring. Um, you know, you've seen 
the integration of the computer, the smartphone, the internet, uh, but this is an entirely different, you know, animal. Um, I recognize that, uh, you know, computer science is, uh, had some of the algorithms for, for AI as early as the 50s, um, but what you're seeing now is kind of the, the collision of all the components that, that really allow this thing to be effective, and, and that is not only the algorithms, but the processing power, and then finally, you know, I think the last piece that has really hit full force is is the, the digitized data and, and and so jeremy um you know can you uh maybe just give us a flavor for why this has evolved so quickly and kind of the, the what would be the transformational impact of, of what's going on here sure well uh, i think i've touched on that uh and uh, to answer the prior question but Really, our investment strategies are based on this overarching view that we're in the early stages of a technological revolution. And AI is a general purpose technology that can be applied to all industries, all markets, and it's happening now. And, uh, you know, we've been automating work for decades, uh, but the tools were fairly limited and primarily mechanical. And so you, you, you look at robotics and how it started, you know, 1960s in automotive factories. But um, today we're adding intelligence to automation. And, and this is happening now because a number of enabling technologies are converging and, and finally making it possible. We now have extremely powerful sensors and uh, processing chips at a reasonable cost. We have uh, hyperscale data centers that can process enormous amounts of data in milliseconds. We have uh, ultra fast and reliable communication networks to deliver this intelligence to machines wherever we need it and when we need it. And, and, and this is not a linear process. Um, this is an exponential process because these technologies are exponential in nature. And so every year performance, be it computing power or network and communication, performance improves and cost declines. And that ratio, the ratio of performance to cost uh, improves by a, a pretty constant uh, percentage every year. And that drives adoption. It's, it's right slow, it's, it's more slow uh, in the case of uh, uh, semiconductors. So we are at this inflection point. And I think uh, the market is telling us that uh, it is happening now. Look at the, the Think Index uh, performance, not only this year, but uh, over uh, the, the past three years and, and, and five years. And you can, you can see the, the, the market is telling us the moment is now. Okay, great. So I think we all agree that AI is, is, is at a critical point in, in being implemented across all kinds of um, areas of the economy. Lisa, where specifically, can you give us some, some examples of, you know, industries in which you're seeing more rapid adoption than others and maybe some use cases? Yeah. And, you know, what was interesting during our due diligence on playing the think strategy together um, was that AI's vast reach were not just in the consumer arena. Um, we, many of us know about Amazon's Alexa and Apple Siri and all of the smart devices that are around us at home. Um, but we found that enterprises have been quietly and slowly been adopting AI to solve their business process needs for some time, um, whether it was using through cybersecurity um, or whatnot. So we, we were really surprised to find that um, financial services industry, for example, were one of the earliest adopters of AI and they've been using machine learning algorithms for detecting bank frauds and automating some uh, back office tasks for the past several years. Some of the new opportunities though that financial services industry is really going after and using AI um, that's being used today in the banking sector is in the mobile payment and loan and mortgage processing. Um, freeing up hundreds of thousands of hours um, of legal review that's been taken over a year, um, every year. So, and, and insurance companies are using AI now 
um, with their computer vision technology detect entrance claims that are fraudulent. Um, AI can detect if an image was photoshopped. So if a, if a tree that fell in your car uh, that made a dent, AI knows whether that type of dent could be created by the tree fall. So these are some of the exciting things that um, financial service industry has embraced. Um, and we think that they are uh, leading kind of the AI adoption at the moment. And I think we'll, we'll see that continuing. Um, I think the potential impact of AI and machine learning um, and deep learning is pretty massive. McKinsey um, estimates that AI will create 13 to $15 trillion in global um, economic value over uh, the next 10 years. And that's a very big number. And we believe that there are other industries that are rapidly embracing this. Um, uh, the retail industry, for example, um, e-commerce has disrupted the retail industry for the last 10 years. And what we're really seeing is that AI is being used by the e-commerce platform providers to innovate. Now, um, it's empowering uh, the merchants to understand who their customers are and how to engage with us. And this is something that we're seeing um, with some of our index members, companies like Shopify and Wix are enabling and empowering some of these merchants to have this type of technology. So, so we, we're seeing a lot of exciting things happening in the retail industry. And also let's not forget healthcare, um, AI and drug discovery, uh, wearable devices using artificial intelligence for medical diagnosis um, are some areas that we're seeing, we're making tremendous progress in that industry. Um, we have an index member, uh, Verisite, um, that is, has created a nasal swab test to detect lung cancer using machine learning algorithms. So these are some of the unique products that are gonna be coming out for, um, for the patients and for us to use. And I think these are some exciting areas and, and we're really excited about the future of healthcare using some of these AI deployments. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's really fascinating. There's a lot going on in, in all facets of the economy. So you alluded to this earlier, but maybe you can get a, a bit more granular um, when you were putting together uh, the Think Index. Um, can you give us some more details around that and, and how the Think Index is designed to actually capture you know, the, 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 all the value that is potentially mm -hmm. there and the growth uh, of, of AI. Yeah, we were, we were um, very thoughtful in designing the strategy that we want to capture the entire AI ecosystem for investors because we think it's important to not just capture the enablers and developers of AI, but also it's important to include companies that are leveraging AI to go after massive revenue opportunity. So our methodology is pretty unique in that we looked at um, companies that have pure revenue purity in AI initiatives to companies to that invested in AI through R&D and CapEx. Um, building a team of data science and software engineers through either recruiting or M&A activities. Um, we believe that investments in building AI capabilities is a very good indicator of future revenue opportunities. And um, also to be included in our list of universe, um, our index members need to show that they're building or leveraging techniques in machine learning, uh, natural language processing, computer vision, just to name a few. Um, it is a very diversified exposure to all of the key companies benefiting from AI adoption and transformation. So um, as an example, um, companies like NVIDIA, Twilio, and Alteryx are enablers of AI as they're empowering the software developers to analyze massive data sets to, um, to help build intelligent applications. Um, meanwhile, companies like Shopify and Wix are leveraging AI um, to help merchants use valuable data to, that they have gathered to offer innovative solutions um, like the marketing tools using AI that are embedded with AI capabilities and futures to get customers to make that transaction. Okay, thank you. Um, let's uh, 
I've got a question that is probably on uh, many of the participants' minds, and and that is, um, and Jeremy, maybe I'll let you run with this one. How has uh, this uh, healthcare crisis, this pandemic, um, affected the the strategy, and, and and what opportunities do you see? Um, well, it, as I said in in my earlier comments, I think. Uh, this crisis has served as a catalyst uh, to accelerate adoption of many of the technologies that, that we look at. Um, I have talked about the logistics and warehouse automation uh, that supports the uh, e-commerce industry. Uh, we could talk about uh, remote patient monitoring in, uh, in, in healthcare. Uh, telemedicine, of course, uh, where we've seen um, pretty much everybody try uh, a remote doctor-patient visit during the, the, the past few months. You know, technology that had been growing very healthy in the past few years, we've been tracking for, for some time, suddenly sees a major step up in terms of uh, of adoption and, and companies like Teladoc uh, here in the U.S. or uh, Pingan, good doctor over in, uh, in, in China, have managed to uh, really deliver on uh, uh, the consumer and, and patient's expectations um, during, during those times. Now, in terms of market action, um, uh, I don't think it would be fair to say that we were not surprised by, by what happened. Uh, certainly the, the pace of uh, decline in uh, equity prices during the month of March. Um, but, but at the same time, really, um, you know, the, the, uh, I think at the end of the day, we've moved into a phase where uh, the, the recession has already happened. And, and, and generally for investors, you know, that's, that's the right time to, um, to have a constructive uh, view of, uh, of markets and to be deploying uh, capital. And, 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 and certainly we're believers that uh, robotics, AI, healthcare technology is one of the best areas to, to, to do that um, right now. And Travis, okay, I'd, like, yeah. I'd like to just add to that is that I think digital transformation was already underway before the pandemic. Um, and I think the, what's, what we're seeing now is that uh, the, the shift to the cloud has really accelerated the AI adoption. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies talking on their conference calls, uh, wanting to innovate more um, in updating and uh, modernizing their architecture. So you should expect to see some of the capital spending increase over time. And I think many of the organizations were caught flat-footed and some of the architecture was really tested. Some failed and some succeeded. So we're, we're gonna see some of the capital spending around uh, innovating your architecture um, to increase. And many of our index members are already seeing some of that benefit happening. Um, we've had a couple of index members actually even indicate on their conference calls that a couple of years of digital transformation just happened in a matter of weekend. So those are some of the shifts that we think are um, structural and also um, permanent. Great, thanks. I, I, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that uh, we've got. We, we received uh, this question or similar to it uh, a number of times and it's uh, compare uh, robo to think. Uh, and then I think in doing that, maybe also comparing, um, you know, we've had some questions on our strategies compared to our competitors, you know, what differentiates us. So um, I'll let you guys figure out who wants to take that one. Let's just, let's start with robo to think. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the biggest um, difference is that the think strategy is really a pure play strategy around artificial intelligence. Um, the overlap between the think strategy and robo is very small. We're talking about about 15% overlap between the index members. Um, I think 
also the robo strategy um, or capturing more of the value chain of the robotics and automation companies as well as artificial intelligence. Um, while the think strategy just purely um, captures the AI ecosystem. So you're gonna see a very large tilt toward US companies because right now US is a leader in, in developing and enabling artificial intelligence. Um, the market cap is also uh, much larger with the think strategy uh, because we do have some of the larger cloud providers that are playing a very key role in building the AI ecosystem, um, but they do tend to have a larger market cap. Okay, let, let me take the competition uh, question. I think that that's really important. Um, if only because uh, in the past few years, we've, we've really seen a raft of new funds and ETFs uh, and indices going after uh, robotics and, and AI. Um, if you go back to 2013, when Robo was launched, uh, it was the, uh, pretty much the only vehicle available and now you have uh, well over a dozen uh, a dozen um, so how is robo different from the, from 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 these um, well first if you uh, look at the portfolios uh, you'll see uh, an enormous difference in fact we haven't been able to find a competing uh, index of fund with more than a 30 percent overlap with, with our strategies so clearly there's something very different. And I think it goes back to the process. We have a very research driven process where we analyze every company that touches our theme. And we analyze them for revenue purity. We want to provide that exposure through companies that are uh, directly geared to uh, the technologies and applications. Um, and then we look for long-term quality drivers. Uh, long-term drivers of, of value creation. Uh, so we score our companies on a number of metrics, including technology and market leadership. So uh, we look for companies that have a track record of being innovators and staying on top of their segment. We look for companies that have a high market share in, in what they do. And that generally translates into strong financial performance. Uh, another important difference is that we combine that research approach with uh, the benefits of index investing. Uh, and so you have a number of active funds out there uh, that can be highly concentrated in uh, you know, their best ideas. We don't do that at all. Uh, what we do is that every quarter we rebalance to a modified equal weight. And uh, that means, uh, I know some of you will think, well, we, we're not letting our, our winners run. And, and that's right, but at the same time, uh, we provide a smoother ride from point A to point B. And you can see that in uh, the volatility uh, metrics, for, for example. Uh, I wanna touch on uh, the benefits of uh, an ETF tracking an index, if only because of the low cost advantage and uh, the tax benefits that come with it uh, as compared with uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, traditional uh, mutual funds. And then the last point I'll make is that you'll see a lot of uh, the, the largest issuers of uh, ETFs out there uh, that are um, uh, providing exposure to robotics in a, in a very different way. In fact, in, um, uh, we believe in a, in, in a way that doesn't incorporate uh, a significant research effort. Thanks, Jeremy. That, uh, that was great. Um, so, I think we probably have time for, for one more question. Um, and then if we did not get to your question uh, as a participant, uh, we will get back to you individually. Um, so Lisa, maybe the, the, the last question for you is twofold. One is, um, as, you look, as you look out over the next you know, three, five years, what most excites you uh, about AI and, and what potential uh, obstacles do you see? Um, I think the most exciting um, aspect of AI is to have, um, I'm really excited to have self-driving vehicles. Um, I know that on the consumer side, we're probably five to 10 years away having uh, fully autonomous vehicles in our lives. 
but I'm starting to see a lot of progress being made on the enterprise side. Um, think about long haul trucks. Um, Amazon just acquired um, self autonomous vehicle technology and they have been investing heavily in the last couple of years for self driving trucks for their package deliveries. So, and some of the the research that we've seen um, really indicate that there's been a lot of progress being made on the commercial side. Um, there's, we already have the self-driving um, forklifts for the agricultural industry and it's working great. Um, on the consumer side, while we are still in that level 3.5 to maybe level four autonomy at this point, we are making a lot of progress. Um, companies like Waymo um, are, pretty much um, having some success with their uh, daily drive. They, they're doing dozen drives, um, fully autonomous every day, and the reviews are getting better. So, you're, so I'm, I'm really excited about that, and Jeremy will tease me because I don't drive. So I'm super excited that I don't have to retake the driving test. Um, I'm, I'm really just hoping that this will happen a lot sooner than I hope. Um, so that's that's one of the areas I'm excited about. Um, adoption hurdle, I think the, the biggest thing that we found during the AI white paper and putting together think strategy is that there's this extreme shortage of talent out there. And it's not just about finding a data scientist to run your AI capabilities and, and your AI research in your organization. You need an entire um, team of project managers, software developers, and the data science team and you also need some really deep pockets to build and spend money on the technology architecture. So a lot of the organizations don't have that. So we're very excited to find companies like Twilio that are providing API tools for enterprises to use off the shelf. You don't have to have a data science to run some of these applications. They're just working with software engineers to create this interface. So we're really excited to see that ecosystem building and that's where you're going to see the adoption happening over time. Great. Uh, okay, so I want to wrap up. There's a couple of things I would like to mention. First, um, if you have a moment uh, to complete the survey, uh, you can find it in the, the chat area. Also, if you asked a question anonymously, um, please email us um, at uh, insights at roboglobal.com that's insights i-n-s-i-g-h-t-s at roboglobal.com so we can answer your question directly uh, directly otherwise uh, we won't have uh, the ability to do that so let's uh, wrap it up uh, thanks lisa thanks jeremy uh, and thank you all for attending um, we appreciate it and uh, feel free to reach out to us with any follow-up questions thank, thank you, you.